Welcome back, folks. This is lecture number five in our exploration of industrial electricity. Today's lecture is a bit of a mixed lecture. We are going to review series parallel. Then we're going to introduce something called the voltage divider and current divider. This is a mixed lecture because we're also going to explore magnetics. Let's look at that series parallel resistor question. So solve for the total resistance given this circuit. Your opening move is to sketch a box around these two resistors. And we would say that the resistance of that box is 4 plus 8, or 12 ohms. We then redraw the circuit. So here's that 5 ohm resistor that we originally had. Here is the 6 ohm resistor. And now in green, we add the resistor we just calculated. And that was 12 ohms in parallel with 6 ohms. Once again, we draw a box. We can calculate the resistance of that box. So 1 over our box is 1 over 6 plus 1 over 12. Going to our calculator, 6 inverse plus 12 inverse equals inverse equals. So that's 4 ohms. We redraw the circuit again. Here's the original 5. Here's the 4 we just calculated. So 4 ohms, 5 ohms, and we should draw another box. And finally, we arrive at our result, which is 9 ohms. Okay, so we took the circuit and we redrew it many times, simplifying each time as we went along. What I wanted to show you is that there is another way to think about this. We did talk about sketching a box around the circuit. Easy enough. We could say that the R, or the resistance of this particular piece, is 8 plus 4. So that's 12 ohms. If we were to then draw a second box, like this, we could talk about the resistance of that box. So the resistance of this box is 6 in parallel with 12. I think we worked that out before. So 6 inverse plus 12 inverse equals inverse equals. So that's 4 ohms. And then we do it one more time. So now we have this largest box right here. Oops, run out of screen there. And we would say that this resistance is equal to 4 plus 5, which is equal to 9 ohms. Both of these methods work equally well. Of course, I did start you with this method because I think it's important that you get the muscle memory to actually draw these schematics and because it allows you to clearly see what's being substituted for what. But as we go along and as you do more of these problems and gain more experience, you could see that this larger box within box method might be quite useful to you. Speaking of things that are useful, let's look at the voltage divider. This is applicable to series circuits, and it goes something like this. Here's a series circuit. We'll let the supply be 100 volts DC. We have an R1, an R2, an R3, and we'll let those be 10k ohm, 20k ohm, and 30 kilo ohms. Our objective is to find the voltage across R2. This is what the voltage divider rule tells us. It tells us the voltage of interest is equal to the resistor of interest 
over the total series resistance multiplied by the source voltage. We've got to be careful here because this T for total is series. For example, in this particular circuit, it's 10K plus 20K plus 30K. That is the total series resistance. This one here is the resistor of interest. And this is the voltage of interest. For this particular problem, we're looking for the voltage on R2. And we would say that is equal to the resistor of interest. In this case, it's 20K over the total series resistance, which is 10K plus 20K plus 30K. And all that is multiplied by the source voltage, which is 100 volts. With some simplification, we would say that this is 20 over 60 by 100, which gives us an R2 voltage of about 33 volts. There it is. Be sure to add that to your note card. That is the voltage divider formula. We can contrast this with our older tools. Before I told you that, you would have to have calculated the current for the circuit first. And you would have said the current is equal to 100 volts. Let's see, a current. Yeah, a current. A voltage divided by resistance. So 100 volts divided by 10K plus 20K plus 30K plus 30K would have given you a current of about 1.6 milliamps. From there, you would have said the voltage on R2 is equal to, so a voltage is a current times a resistance, so 1.6 milliamps by 20K. Solving for that, the voltage on R2 is about 33 volts. We see both solutions provide the same answer. But I would argue the voltage divider is a little bit nicer because it's a single step method. We only used one formula, whereas over here it was a two step process. First, you had to calculate the current, and once you knew the current, you could calculate the voltage. That was the voltage divider rule. Let's talk about the current divider rule. This works for parallel circuits. Here's an example. Let this be 200 milliamps. The current divider rule tells us that the current of interest is equal to the total parallel resistance over the resistor of interest multiplied by the source current. And you got to be careful when we're talking about this T that's total parallel. Okay, so the total parallel of these three resistors together. To solve this, we would say that 1 over the parallel resistance is equal to 1 over 1200 plus 2200 plus 1 over. 3300, which gives us an R parallel of 1200 inverse plus 2200 inverse plus 3300 inverse equals inverse. So about 629 ohms. Okay, so that's, that's RT in this particular case. Ah, I should have put this up here earlier, but let's find the current through R2. To calculate that, we use the current divider rule, and we say the current through R2 is equal to the parallel piece divided by the resistance of R2 multiplied by the source current. So that works out to 629 divided by 2200 equals multiplied by 0.2. Now 
we would say the current through R2 is approximately 57 milliamps. Again, that was the current divider. We can compare this to our older tools. Our older tools would have told us that the source voltage is a current times a resistance. We need to calculate our parallel. We already said that was about 629 ohms. So the source voltage is 0 0.2, which is the current, multiplied by that resistance. So the source voltage is about 126 volts. From there, the current on R2 is a voltage divided by the resistance, which gives us our 57 milliamps. That is the current divider. You may want to put this equation on your note card. It will save you some time and effort later on. I did say this was going to be a mixed lecture. So we're going to shift gears now. We're going to talk about magnet and magnetism. This may seem like an odd segue, but in the near future, we're going to talk about transformers motors, generators, relays, solenoids, and I suppose we might even talk about speakers. You could argue that all of these things are the foundation of electronics. Certainly they're the foundation of industrial electronics. We need those transformers for the delivery of alternating current. We wouldn't get anywhere without the generators and of course the motors to drive our world. In fact, one of our targets is to talk about something called the induction motor. Now there's quite a few things that go into the induction motor. We have magnetics, which we're briefly introducing today. We have three phase AC power. We have something called complex power. One of the upcoming lectures will see that complex power is very much a question of magnetics. And we also have transformer properties. These are all concepts we need to explore in order to understand how the induction motor operates. We may as well start with the beginning and play with some magnets. So if you had a north pole and a south pole, we could talk about a magnetic flux line that travels like so. And magnetic flux lines travel in loops, right? So if one line leaves, it has to land back on the South Pole, okay? And they all originate from the North Pole and travel like so. If we had another magnet and we brought it into proximity and we let this be a North and this is South, we would look at those lines like so. And from your childhood experience, I'm sure you know what happens next. And of course, those two magnets are going to come together. So north, south, and north, south. Our flux lines now look like this. One of the arguments you could make is that the lines are actually shorter when the magnets are in this position. But those flux lines aren't as short as they could be. Maybe you've experienced this. If you played with those magnets, you know that they will naturally want to rest in this position. What you'll find is that those flux lines are largely contained within the magnet itself now, with only a few leaving on the edges. You could think about this as an energy state. Let's say we had a hill, and on top of that hill we had a ball. And you know that the ball will want to roll downhill. So we could talk about this being a low energy state and this being a high energy state. And magnetic flux lines are like that. The smaller they are, the lower energy state they're in. This might explain this situation. So say you have a metal plate and you're down here and you took your magnet and you stuck it onto that metal plate. So there's your north-south. And that magnet has no problem hanging on to that iron. 
because those flux lines are all concentrated. They're all very short and they're all passing through the iron. It turns out magnetic flux lines like to pass through iron, much more so than air. So again, if this magnet was free, right, if it was down here before you attached it, the flux lines are like this. Right? They're emanating out in all directions. However, as soon as you stick it onto that iron, it'll hold itself against gravity because the magnetic flux lines are in a lower energy state. Suppose we take that magnet, right? so here it is, north and south, and we attach it to an iron bar like so. How would you describe the magnetic flux lines? I would argue that there will be some going this way, but there will be just as many flowing this way. Suppose we took out that magnet and we made this just one big chunk of iron, right? If you made a, a C out of iron, and then you got some wire, and you wrapped the wire this way. So you started with a current source, wrap the wire many times around this iron bar and then came back. Well, we've just made an electromagnet. And as before, we're going to have flux lines. Some of them are going to go this way. Some of them are going to go this way. Okay, they're going to travel in that direction. If we continue on and maybe we modify this we bring this piece down, maybe curve it, we'll curve this piece. All right, so now we have this, this gap with a, with a hole in it. We would expect almost all of the magnetic flux lines to go in this direction. There will hardly be any back here anymore because they tend to seek the shortest path, right? That's what we agreed to. Just like the iron holds it, or excuse me, just like the magnet holds itself up against gravity, these magnetic flux lines will seek the shortest path. If we continue with this line of thought, we're going to end up with something that looks like this. Now we put those coils of wire here. You may recognize that as the field winding for a motor. Now, suppose, suppose we took a piece of soft iron and installed it on a pivot within that gap. We would say that these magnetic field lines would go into the rotor, they would come out, and they would wrap around like so. Right, they would come in, go through the rotor, wrap around, because magnetic flux lines always travel in loops. But then something really interesting happens. As these lines go, they're going to grab on to that rotor. And just like the magnet that would pull itself up against gravity to make the flux line short, the same thing's going to happen here. This rotor piece is going to move and it's going to end up right here. It's going to align itself so that the flux lines are as short as they possibly can be. Magnetic flux lines want to be short. It's what they do and they will actually move iron to make it happen. They will move the rotor and of course once it's in that position it'll stay in that position which is why in a real motor, we would need additional windings. So in a real motor, you might have another set of windings here, another set here, another set here, and then there would be different coils that would activate that. So in yellow is your phase A coil, in green is your phase B coil, and then we'll let blue be the phase C coil. And by turning these on at the proper time, you can actually rotate that member about the pivot. 
It's called a variable reluctance motor. In that example, we assumed that this rotor was a piece of soft iron, but it could also be a permanent magnet or another electromagnet. And it would still do the same thing. If you activated a coil, those flux lines would establish themselves. For example, if we activated coil A, that magnet would align itself perfectly, just like these magnets would. Okay, again, keeping the flux lines as short as possible. If you activated another set of coils, well, that magnet is going to rotate so that it's aligned with them. We're getting ahead of ourselves here, but we did introduce some interesting things. We talked about motors briefly. We talked about three phase because there are three different windings physically placed around this rotor. We talked about torque a little bit, and we talked about keeping the shortest magnetic paths. Many things to consider and many things for us to talk about in the future. Here's something you might be interested in. We already know Ohm's law, but you might be interested to know, but you might be interested to know that there's another law called Hopkinson's law. Ohm's law is to electricity as Hopkinson's law is to magnetics. The rules go like so. E is equal to IR. We even have a wheel for that. E, I, R. On the other side, we see that the magnetomotive force is equal to phi by reluctance. Again, we can put that into a wheel. Magnetomotive force, the magnetic flux, and the reluctance. On this side, we have E, which is voltage. Here we have the magnetomotive force. Otherwise known as MMF, magnetomotive force. The units on this are amp turns. So we have amps and we have turns. We'll talk about the importance of that in a moment. Let's see, what else did we have? Over here, we have current. Here, we have magnetic flux. So that must be the thing that flows. And we talked about that. We talked about flux lines and the fact that they flow in circles, just like current flows in a circle. Resistance, and over here we have reluctance. And the units for reluctance are amp turns per Weber, if you're interested. We can build electric circuits, where we talk about the voltage and we have a current that flows. We can build magnetic circuits. We talk about an electromotive force, a flow, and reluctance. In this particular case, it's the magnetic flux. If we were to physically draw an electric circuit, we might start with a battery, plus and minus. And we have some wires, some resistors. So we'll put in four resistors this time. Okay, so there's an electrical circuit with four resistors. This is a magnetic circuit with four reluctances. We have the core reluctance. We have the rotor reluctance. And we have air gap. There's an air gap there, and there's an air gap there. If this is an electromagnet, We'll attach our current source, and then we'll have the windings. Now, I mentioned two things before, didn't I? I mentioned the fact that there was amps, right? So amps, and then how many turns of wire. So that's where amp turns come from. It is quite literally that. It's how many turns are on this device, and what's the current flowing through them. 
amp turns. If you find this material interesting, you might want to take a physics class, or you could go on and take some of the advanced electrical engineering classes where they talk about motors, and you get to do all the calculations with these magnetic circuits. For our short-term goals, just understand that both magnetic and electrical circuits may be modeled using the same thought processes. And remember this one right here, remember amp turns. That's very important to us. Speaking of amp turns, there's something I wanted to share with you. Suppose you had a piece of iron. You would agree that that iron is composed of many small particles. Some of those particles will have magnetic fields in and of themselves. Those magnetic fields are probably randomly oriented. The net result is that this piece of iron does not appear to be a magnet. However, if you were to subject this iron to a magnetic field, you would expect these particles to start to align themselves. They would align themselves with the field. So now instead of being random, they all generally point in the same direction. Suppose that iron is in our electromagnet. I think you'll agree that as we increase the current, or as we put more turns on this coil, we're increasing our amp turns. We're increasing our magnetomotive force. That would tend to make all of these magnetic domains align up. That would tend to align all of these magnetic domains as we have this flux that flows in a circle through this core and through the air gap. What I wanted to tell you is that there's a limit. You can only increase the drive on this magnetic circuit so much, because what happens is as soon as all the magnetic domains are lined up, you're pretty much done. You can't get any more out of it. You can't get any more aligned than fully aligned. So what happens is something called saturation. And that is a property that we'll explore later when we talk about motors. As I said, we're getting ahead of ourselves, so we're going to move on to something else. Let's circle back. So let's assume we have a current source, and we have a wire, and that wire ends up back at the current source. What I wanted to talk to you about is something called the right-hand rule. And it goes like this. We need our right hand. It's around here somewhere. Okay, you need your right hand. Then you need something to grasp. So I'll show you my camera or the calculator. Let's assume that there is a current flowing in this direction, right? So there's a current flowing in this direction. So what you need to do is take your thumb and grasp the thing in your hand. Okay, take your thumb and grasp the thing in your hand with your thumb, with your thumb pointing in the direction of the current. And what you'll find is that the magnetic field will curl around the wire in the same way that your fingers are. Let's see if we can make some sense of that. So in this case, the current is flowing in that direction. So you take your thumb, you put your thumb in the direction of the current, and then your fingers curl around the wire. And they curl around like so. That is what the magnetic field looks like. If you move your hand along the wire and you end up down in the lower part here, your thumb is still pointing in this direction, and now your fingers are wrapping around like so. We call this the right hand rule. Okay, there's something you need to know. We have conventional current flow, and we have electron current flow. In conventional current flow, we would have a battery such as this, 
and we would describe a current flowing in that direction. So there's the positive terminal of the battery, and we're flowing in a clockwise direction. If we were talking about electron flow, we have the same battery, we have the same resistor, except now we've assumed the current is flowing in the opposite direction. If you're talking about conventional current flow, you'll use the right-hand rule. And if you're talking about electron current flow, you'll use the left-hand rule. This leaves us with a bit of a problem. Do we use the right-hand rule and assume that current flows out of the positive terminal of the battery? Or do we use the electron current flow where the current flows out of the negative part of the battery? The answer is, it doesn't matter. They're both perfectly acceptable. In fact, you could even purchase a textbook dealing with conventional flow, and you could purchase the exact same textbook for electron flow. The only difference is that every picture that deals with current flow has been flipped right, to show the current going in the opposite direction. And every time it talks about the right-hand rule in one book, it'll talk about the left-hand rule in the other. Being as this is lecture five, and because you haven't complained so far, you are stuck with the right-hand rule. We have been drawing our circuits like this for some time. We've been showing that the current is flowing out of the positive terminal of the battery, and you're stuck. We're using the right-hand rule. So answer all of your questions as if it was the right-hand rule. We will use the right-hand rule. I can already feel the arrows being pointed at me. How's that for a bad pun? But a good segue. On an arrow, this is the fletching. This is the tip. We use this arrow in two different ways. We could use it to describe the direction of the magnetic field. We could also use it to describe the direction that the current is flowing. If you had a wire, and the current was flowing in that wire such that all you saw was the fletching, right? that would mean the current is going into the page. If the current was flowing into the page, we would have a magnetic field that looked like so. If we had another wire and the current was flowing out of the page so that all you saw was the tip, the magnetic field would be in the opposite direction. It would look like this. This gets interesting when you have two wires and you put them next to each other. So if this one has a current flowing into the page and this one has a current flowing out of the page, we established that the magnetic field is looking like this whereas this one is in the opposite direction. Instead of drawing as complete circles, we could draw them as smaller line segments. So if you were to stand here as an observer, you would see the magnetic field going to the right. And if you were at the lower part, you would see it going to the left, and so on and so forth. which would mean this is a north, this is a south, this is a north, this is a south, south and south, north and north. Which means that these two wires, because of the interactions here, will tend to push apart. Whereas if you had two wires that had the current going in the same direction, in this case into the page, you would have magnetic fields like this, that would be a north, a south, a south, a north. And I think you can see that these would tend to pull together through the interaction of these pieces right here. Let me share a quick story. I used to work on a transmitter, and that transmitter had an inductor. And what it was was about a, a core, you know, maybe, maybe a foot and a half and about 
a foot deep, and it had many, many turns of wire wrapped around it. It was used as part of the power supply in the transmitter. So you had about 11,000 volts here, and then you had that solenoid with just a coil of wire. Right? We learned to call this an inductor. That inductor, or excuse me, this, the system was used to drive vacuum tubes, and every once in a while these vacuum tubes would have a fault where they would arc internally. And what would happen is you'd have a very high current on this inductor. Now, if we look at that inductor from a slightly different perspective, you could think of the wraps of wire like this on either side of that cylinder. On one side, the current's coming to you, and as it passes around, it leaves, right? So you end up with a structure that looks like this. And we established that there was a magnetic field like this on every single one of these current-carrying inductors. A couple things to notice here. First, you'll recognize that that is this situation here, right? As far as any wire is concerned, the wire adjacent to it has the current going in the same direction. So these will tend to pull together, which was a pretty bad deal for me because this coil here would actually destroy itself over the course of a year. Every time those vacuum tubes had a fault, there would be a high current in the inductor. Every time there was a high current, those wires would pull in. They would tighten up. And the force was so great, they would actually break the fiberglass bolts that held this inductor together. So about once a year, you'd have to take the thing apart. You'd have to unwind the entire coil. Again, because there was so much force pulling those wires together. Anyway... Back to these wires, you'll notice the magnetic field is pointing in the same direction for all of them. What that means is that this thing appears to be a bar magnet. Right? When you put the wires together like this, you've created a solenoid, and you have the same properties as the bar magnet. If you were to put a piece of iron in here, it would be indistinguishable from a bar magnet. You've just created an electromagnet, and you'll have these magnetic flux lines flowing like so, which is back where we started. Which brings us back here to our discussion about flux lines flowing in the core, like so. Or, if we turned on this, they would flow like so. I have one last thought before we leave for today. Suppose we have this structure. We recognize this structure and we realize that there are magnetic flux lines flowing through the core and through the air gap, like so. Let's take a wire and run it through the aperture. To the end of that wire, let's add a voltmeter. What you would find is if you move the wire in this direction, if you passed it through the aperture, it would generate a voltage. If you move the wire in this direction, up and down, you would find that it does not produce a voltage. Look at it this way. We have this magnetomotive force establishing flux lines in this structure. Those lines pass through the aperture. The wire, when the wire moves this way, it is cutting across those lines. And a wire that cuts across flux lines will have a voltage induced upon it. If the wire was moving in this direction, it is not cutting through flux lines. It's moving with the flux lines. No voltage is generated. So we got to cut those flux lines in order to induce a voltage. What if 
we took this voltmeter and replaced it with a current source. I think you'll agree that this is no longer just a wire. This wire has its own magnetic field associated with it. The magnetic field from the wire will interact with the magnetic field in this core, causing the wire to move in that direction or that direction, depending upon which way this current source is configured. Well, thanks for sticking around. I hope you enjoyed that. We are right now on the doorstep. We are on the doorstep of talking about motors and generators. Next time around, we'll talk about alternating current, and we'll pick up right here, talking about the effects of a wire moving in a magnetic field.